Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to On Being an Earthkeeper. My name is Chris Selig, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at uh, Castro Valley Library. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about your Zoom experience before we get started. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a button for live transcript. And if you click on that, you can click to show subtitles if you would like. Um, at the bottom, there's also a chat window and, uh, and a Q&A. The, the chat has been disabled, but the Q&A is live and you can um, put questions in there for our panelists. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that we have been having some um, technical di difficulties <laughs> today, but we're going to make the best of it. And um, soon Mr. Mamaday and his daughter Jill will come on and we're going to start with some introductions. Um, I would like to uh, introduce Zoe Dorado first. Uh, Zoe is the first person selected as the Alameda County Youth Poet Laureate. She also happens to be a junior at Castro Valley High right here in our little town. Uh, Zoe's first love is spoken word poetry, which uh, she writes with intention of connecting the personal to the political. And I, I recommend you look her up on our website to hear some of Zoe's work. In addition to poetry, Zoe has a great love of music. She has been drumming for more than eight years and is a member of the Castro Valley High Jazz Band. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you, Chris. Um, we are thrilled to be hosting N. Scott Mamaday, who is joining us from his home in New Mexico. Mr. Mamaday is a storyteller, poet, novelist who has devoted much of his life to celebrating and preserving Native American culture, especially its oral tradition. A member of the Kiowa tribe who was born um, and grew up on Indian reservations throughout the Southwest. He's been hailed as the Dean of American Indian Writers by the New York Times. In 1969, Mr. Mamaday became the first Native American to be awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his novel House Made of Dawn. His numerous awards and honors include the National Medal of Honors of Arts, and he is the 2021 recipient of the Frost Medal for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in Poetry. He's the author of more than 17 books, including the one we are here to discuss today, Earth Keeper. In this moving and lyrical collection of prose poetry, Mr. Mamaday recalls stories of his childhood that have been passed down through generations stories that reveal a profound and sacred connection to the American landscape and a reverence for the natural world. In his book, he offers an homage and a warning. He reminds us that the earth is a sacred place of wonder and beauty, a source of strength and healing that must be protected before it's too late. And as an extra special treat, we are joined by his daughter, Jill Scott Mamaday, an actress and filmmaker. We highly recommend her short film, Return to Rainy Mountain, based on her father's best-selling book, The Way to Rainy Mountain. And Jill will be reading selections today from Earthkeeper. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thanks, Zoe. That was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mamaday and Jill, thank you so much for being here. Um, I mentioned to the audience before that we were having a little bit of technical difficulty, but we're all going to work through it and uh, be patient together. Um, we, my first question is that we chose uh, this book after um, a, long, a long search for a book where we could talk about climate change as a community. And I wonder if you could start, Mr. Mamaday, by telling us if you were primarily thinking of the climate crisis when you wrote this book and a little bit about how it came together. Was, I was thinking about climate, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, but I was also thinking about um, the oral tradition of the Kiowa people. I'm very, I'm very much involved in uh, preserving that uh, that tradition, and um, so that's how the book came about. I just put those two things together, and and here we have it. Well, it came it came together beautifully, and I'd like to let people know that some of your beautiful artwork <coughs> is is in the book as well. Yes, thank you. Um, and I was wondering if um, Jill could read page 57 um, of Earthkeeper. 
Yes. All right. A friend colleague of mine wrote of the machine in the garden and another wrote of the virgin land. These writings center on the coming of the industrial age to a pastoral America and the notion of manifest destiny, respectively. Both are important studies of American literature, and as such, they focus upon the past. But it is the present and the possibilities of a future that must concern us. Ours is a damaged world. We humans have done the damage and we must be held to account. We have suffered a poverty of the imagination, a loss of innocence. There was a time when, quote, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, end quote. This new world, quote, commensurate to his capacity for wonder, end quote. I would strive with all my strength to give that sense of wonder to those who will come after me. Thank you so much, Jill. That was beautiful. Um, I have a question for Mr. Mamaday. Um, sort of giving it context, we have a hustle culture where everyone is being chased by deadlines and the need to reach maximum productivity. Um, healthcare workers like my mom, um, teachers, students like myself, and so many others are being judged. Um, our worth and value quantified based on productivity. And so reflecting on that passage, um, Mr. Mamade, can you talk more about um, our, our capacity for wonder, um, how do we protect our capacity for wonder in this culture? Um, and why is wonder so important as we seek to protect the earth and each other? I think probably first should, uh, we should define wonder. What is wonder? <laughs> what are we talking about? Wonder, as I understand it, is... Uh, um, it's incentive. It's uh, uh, probably um, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's inspiration. I think uh, you know we uh, wonder should be something that inspires us. Wonder is um, what we unexpectedly find in in uh, in in the world in which we live. Uh, nature does not want for wonder. Everything. You know that the passages that Jill read from from uh, Earthkeeper about uh, something commensurate to our capacity for wonder. That book that comes from uh, from uh, the Great Gatsby, of course, towards the end, and it describes people coming to the New World, landing on the east coast of this continent, and looking westward, and. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful sight. All of the all of the great all of the great features in the landscapes, say, between the east coast and the west coast. Those things fill us with wonder. And uh wonder wonder is very important. Inspiration is something that interests me a great deal. I want to inspire people. I think inspiration is something we very much need in our time. Our government doesn't seem to be particularly inspired. So um I think uh, we need to concentrate on that a bit. And and uh, we can find wonder, we can see wonder, we can reach, we can visit our national parks. There, there are plenty of ways which we can encounter. And so I had, I had that, that in mind when I wrote that particular page, passage. And there you have it. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. I, I Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes Can you saying. hear us okay? It's a it's a little halting, but I think we're gonna go, we're gonna go forward. We're gonna do our best. That's that's life in a pandemic, yeah. right? <laughs> um thank yes. you. Yes. yes. <laughs> um yeah, so I thank you for that. I mean, so many of the pieces in Earth Keeper. Um, help help inspire our sense of wonder. And some of those have to do when you're talking about Kiowa um, stories and traditions. And 
um, there are a few pieces on um, dragonfly. And for those of us who are not familiar with the Kiowa stories and traditions, Mr. Mamade, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of, of dragonfly? Dragonfly was a holy man. He, was, uh, he died before I was born, but I knew him through my father. The dragonfly would come and visit the homestead where her, my grandparents lived. And he would stay for days, uh, proper, proper Kiowa visit. And uh, my father was a little bit afraid of him because every morning, dragonfly would get up before daylight and he would have his hair in braid and he would paint his face and he would go out and he would pray the sun out of the ground. And my father would watch from hiding and he was very much, uh, you know, in awe of this man. So Dragonfly is an important figure. To me, he's, uh, I, I, I know where he stood when he prayed the sun up. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've stood on a little mound where he stood. And uh, he, he interests me a great deal because he, so spiritual, so spiritual. And, he, and that, that capacity for, for uh spiritual enlightenment, spiritual observation is very much needed in our time. And, and uh, so he, he represents to me, uh, he's a link between us and the earth. And he's, he's, he's a custodian of the earth. And he understands that the earth is alive and spiritual. And he passes that on to us uh, in, in many ways. And, uh, I've, I've written about him before. He continues to be a fascinating character for me. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I love the idea of him of being a steward uh, and um, a connection with the earth and agree completely about the need for a spiritual connection with the earth. Um, there's another person in the book um, in, in the first piece, I believe, and maybe in the last piece, and you describe her as a woman in a beautiful dress. I think in the first piece she's wearing, she's brought her wedding dress with her. And in the last piece, she's in a, do, in a beautiful doe skin dress. And I was wondering if you could tell us who the woman is and, and what we're learning from her in those pieces. These are two different women. The first the forward, uh, I, I talk about a, a woman who I heard about, the uh, grandmother of, of someone I know, mm. who came west in a, in a, in a covered wagon, and uh, she brought her most uh, valuable possession, and one was a wedding dress. I mean, it, it was the most important uh, possession. Not the dress in which she married, but the dress in which she would be made. And so she's coming into a new landscape, a new world, and she's going to make a home for herself, presumably, and she's going to align herself with the landscape of the West. So she's entering the earth in that sense. In the afterward, I talk about a woman my father told me about who was buried in a beautiful dress, a buxton dress, beadwork and elk's teeth. And uh, no one knows who she was now. No one knows her name. She's completely anonymous. No one knows where she's buried. It's just that she's out there in the land, in the landscape. And she's, she has joined herself to the, to the earth in that sense. So I thought that, yes, these are good bookends. This woman who comes to the new world and the woman who is passing away. Yeah, thank you for explaining that to me. Um, I, I know that'll enrich people's understanding of the book when they read it. Yes, um, thank you. I also, um, but in the in the beginning, um, while we were starting our interview, you talked a lot about um, oral history and storytelling and the importance of that. Um, and so I was wondering if you could expand on that. Can you talk more about how oral history and storytelling influenced your life and the writing in Earthkeeper? I talk about the oral tradition for a long time because I've taught it 
uh, in my in my teaching career, I taught uh, oral tradition uh, almost every year that I was I was teaching, and so it's a, it's a subject that interests me greatly. Oral tradition is is a is a very interesting subject in itself. It's it is uh, an aspect of language that we don't think about very often, but every one of us has an oral tradition. We speak daily, and. Uh, you know, the, the, the native oral tradition is, is something else. We, no native tribe has writing, as far as I know. Uh, so the oral tradition is, is uh, very important among those peoples. And I'm, I'm writing now a book about the Kiowas, and I'm talking about the storytelling tradition, oral tradition, and so on. So uh, I, I got interested in oral tradition when my father told me stories when I was a very young boy. And the, I, I loved them so much that I, have them, I had him tell them to me again and again and again until they were firmly in my mind. And uh, then later in my life, after I had become an adult, I started writing them down, which is an interesting thing when you stop to think about it, to take something from the oral tradition and put it into writing that's a that's a, a significant transformation, and so uh, I, I have that uh, uh, that experience of taking the oral tradition and writing it, preserving it. The oral tradition is in some ways more important than writing, because it's spontaneous, and uh, we can take a piece of writing and put it in a desk drawer and be sure that it'll be there when we turn when we return for it. Not so in the oral tradition. The oral tradition is always just one generation from extinction. Mm. So the speaker speaks with great authority and responsibility. The listener listens more carefully and he remembers what he hears. Those are the three most important ingredients of oral tradition. And it's, it's important. We find it today all around us. As I say, everybody has an oral tradition, though very few people think about that. Probably the most important expression of oral tradition in our society is theater, where you see people on the stage talking to each other and gesturing and making eye contact with the audience and so on. So it's an important subject. I really appreciate it, hearing that um described as precious, um, how precious the oral tradition is. I'm sorry, Zoe, I cut off your, your next question. No, I, I love hearing your thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I love thinking about the sort of relationships we have when we share our stories and how the oral tradition sort of captures that connection from the 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 talker and the listener um, and how it can be passed down through generations. I think that's really beautiful. Um, so um, I wanted to ask Jill um, if she would be able to read page um, 38. 38, yes. Let me find it. Here we are. Something of our relationship to the earth is determined by the particular place we stand at a given time. If you stand still long enough to observe carefully the things around you, you will find beauty and you will know wonder. If you see a leaf carried along on the flow of a river, you might ponder its journey. Where did it begin and where will it end? What will be the story of its passage? You will discover a thousand ways in which the leaf is connected to the water, the banks, the near and farther distances, the sky and the sun. Your mind, your spirit will be nourished and grow. You will become one with what you see. Consider what is to be seen. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, this passage mm -hmm. stood out, really stood out to me um, and to Chris. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Mamade, um, well, before I say that, we found Sort of what we wanted to focus on and what captured me um, is the last line of the piece, consider what it is to be seen. Um, we found it deeply affecting. We also love the line um, on page 11, there is no better blessing than to be believed in. 
Um, and so my question is, how do these ideas of being seen um, and being believed in propel us to be earth keepers? Observation is so important. You know, we can go out, we can walk outside our houses and we can observe the land that is um, around us. We can see animals and bees and all kinds of interesting things. We take them for granted. And I think we must stop and think about what we're seeing because it's all very important and it's all of a piece. It all belongs to the earth. And we ought to be interested in the earth. We ought to be, we ought to be uh, loyal to it. We ought to be conscious of it. We ought to be understanding of the morality of preserving the earth. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, the, the second part of that was, was what? the last uh, observing nature and then uh, I forgot yeah. what, what sort of the, the idea last of, question was. How do these ideas of, of being seen and being believed in propel us to be earth keepers? I think really observe the earth without, if we observe it deeply without without wanting to to uh, connect with it, preserve it, uh, revere it. It's it's, uh, it's 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 our it's our home. It's the little planet on which we all live, and we ha we have been very careless of in our, in our in our attitudes and and behavior towards it. We need to think about it more deeply and understand that it is uh, it is our it is our inheritance and it is our hope we all live on the earth and we had better take care of it we've been very careless in that respect we've damaged the earth we've wounded it we've made it cry mm -hmm. and uh, we need to we need to uh, make sure that it is uh, we, we we need to make sure that we are in good relation to the earth we just take care of it because it will take care of us if we do. Yes, thank you. Um, besides that, those ideas of being seen and, and what a blessing um, it is to be believed in, a, another thing that comes through in your writing, not just in Earth Keeper, but in, in much of your writing is um, belonging, um, belonging to the land. Um, belonging like dragonfly has belonging in your dreams you mentioned that on page nine um i know in the past you've talked about you know a sense of belonging to your name belonging uh to the bear um belonging to the kiowa and all of these all resonate uh throughout your work so i was wondering if you uh in that same vein would talk to us about um how our well-being as a people and the well-being of the earth is tied to this sense of belonging. We belong to the earth, it belongs to us. Uh, we belong to each other as, as uh, the human race. We belong to the animal kingdom. Uh, so belonging is uh, the very heart of, of uh, our lives. Uh, I like to I like to think of myself as belonging, and I like to think of things as belonging to me. Um, there's a lot to be said about about concept of belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, what what does it really mean at the, at the at the center? It means that we give ourselves we give ourselves to something because we revere it. We are we understand that it is important to us we we humans have a way of overlooking the importance of things <laughs> and with the industrial revolution we have overlooked much of the uh, values of the earth not that i'm against the not against science or industry these things are important to us but we need to add to our understanding and appreciation of those things an appreciation of the earth and a reverence for it so 
I belong to the earth. The earth belongs to me. I belong to you. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I to you, sir. Yeah, that was, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Jill, I'm wondering if you would uh, read page 40 for us. Yes. There is no love without loss. I hear the drums that vibrate to the heartbeat of the earth. They set me dancing. I see the clouds that wreathe the summits. They set me dreaming. I know the wonder of waves that shake the headlands. They awaken my soul. I hear the screams of eagles on the wind. And I ponder, what are these things to me who loves and does not reckon loss? Do I not keep the earth? Those who came before me did not take for granted the world in which they lived. They bless the air with smoke and pollen. They touch the ground, the trees, the stones with respect and rents. I believe they imagined me before I was born that they prepared the way for me, that they placed their faith and hope in me and in the generations that followed and will follow them. Will I give my children inheritance earth or will I give them less than I was given? When we read um, this book, those last two lines uh, really got to us. Um, will I give my children and inheritance of the earth or will I give them less than I was given? And, you know, the importance of being able to pass a love of the earth from you to your children, from all of us to our children um, is so important. And I just wondered how you felt when you knew you, you had to write those two lines. Will I give my children less than I was given? How did you feel? In, in a certain way, because I I don't know, you know, whether whether they will be given as much as I was given or not. It it we, that's a question that uh, bears upon all of us at the, at the moment, because we are losing things. Um, so uh, at at such a rate, I when I think of the places that I've lived, of the Indian reservations of the Southwest, the reverence. Of the, of the earth was so dominant in those societies. I'm thinking about the ceremonies that I witnessed growing up as, as a boy at, on the Navajo Reservation, for example, in the Jemez Pueblo Reservation, the Apache Reservation. Um, and and I, I think, yes, yes, we need to get back to that appreciation of the environment, the earth around us. Um, I don't know, you know, we in an age now where things are changing at such a rapid pace that I think we are pulling away from nature in, in, in certain respects. I spent, uh, I spent uh, six months in the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union back in the 70s and television was just coming into into that society. And uh, the, the Russian people have such a love for poetry. Um, I, I know people like Evtushenko, uh, I, I was reading his there in an arena that was packed, standing room only, hundreds of people. And I saw people also reading of poetry. And, and I was inspired by that because I'm a poet and we don't have this appreciation in this country. But with the advent of television in the Soviet Union, I'm wondering what difference that might have made. Mm. Are those people still reading books on the subway or are they going to watch hockey games on television? <laughs> I don't know, but I hope it's, uh, I hope it's a health kind of uh, uh, equation. Both things are possible and perhaps desirable, but we must not give up our our appreciation of uh, those things 
than life that our that our, our forebears can tell us about. Yeah, that's I, I love that. Um, I love that connection you made. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, Jill, um, if you can read a uh, read page fifty two mm -hmm. for us. <clears throat> Yes. A teacher once said to me, write little and write well. He was a poet and a man who took literature seriously. He wrote this, quote, unless we understand the history that produced us, we are determined by that history. We may be determined in any event, but the understanding gives us a chance, end quote. What is the critical force of that understanding, I wonder? Are we to witness the eclipse of our civilization, or are we to take the chance? The teacher raised Airedales for show and tended an orchard in his backyard. Had he not taken literature seriously, he told me, he would have been a farmer. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, this, this piece that you read um, reminded me of a favorite quote um, from this Filipino writer um, and activist named Jose Rizal. Um, no history, no self. No history, no self. Um, and so, Mr. Mamade, I was wondering if you can talk more about the importance of understanding the history that produced us the importance as an individual um, and as a larger society. You know, I'm writing a, a book, as I mentioned a, a little while ago about the Kiowas and their migration from the far north and their settling into the Southern Plains where I was born. Um, and part of that book has to do with Iowa calendars the Kiowas kept calendars, pictographic calendars. They would draw uh, a little figure uh, and uh, indicate whether it was the winter or the summer. They had only two entries each year, one the most important event of the winter and the most important event of the summer. And in writing about that and about uh, one of the men who kept calendars, his name was Set An, Little Bear, um, I, I, I had to think about what he was thinking when he took it upon himself to Palander. You know, this is something completely out of, his, out of his sphere of experience. He knew nothing about it, uh, and his and but he began right. He began keeping a calendar in a ledger book, and later it was transferred to us to a hide, a hide painting, which is very beautiful. It's a work of art. But he, I, I said that man invented history. He invented history in his own, on his own terms and in his own community. So most of the entries are not to be understood by us because I'm indicating that this person, that person, and we know about them, the bleakness, they mean nothing to us. So uh, we understand that was writing about his community, which was a large family, and everybody knew everybody else. And so the idea of, of making a history for that community is very important and very, uh, very innovative. No one had ever done that before. These documents are very important. And I think about, ah, yes, this, this is interesting because my, my friend, the professor, who talked about uh, the importance of of, uh, of of knowing one's history, uh, that's one thing, and it's a very important to Western civilization. We we uh, we must have our history. We must know what it is, something about it, because it tells us who we are, and it and it tells us what our prospects are. And uh, so, the idea of history is extremely important in in human events, and and. Uh, I'm interested in the subject because I'm writing about it now. Sait An was interested in, in it for reasons that we probably don't understand 
but it took it upon himself to start keeping a record of things that had happened in his community. And I thought, ah, this, yeah, that's a real breakthrough. That's something that, uh, that uh, is very interesting and important. No, I'm not sure I answered the question entirely. Oh. If I miss something, no. No, that was that was perfect. Um, what you said about sort of centering the history of of your community um, <laughs> was really beautiful. I think I'm I'm listening to the audiobook of a People's History of the United States right now, which sort of like talks about these individual stories um, of women and people of color who have sort of been written out, not written out, but like sort of the, you know, the Eurocentric narrative of the United States has sort of been the center of like our education system. So I was like listening to this book. Um, and just like, I think the focus of communities that have been underrepresented um, when we're like learning about our history, like our collective history, and we can't have our collective history of stories um, of individual communities are are not being, are sort of being tucked under the rug. So I think stressing the importance of that, that your community around you and like documenting that history is really beautiful. So thank you. Um, uh, let's see, let's see. There's, um, there's a Frank Kafka quote I've heard you share in other interviews that a book must be the ax for the frozen sea within us. And there's a quote I like from Tony Cade Bambara where she says, Art should be made to make the revolution irresistible. So um, I was hoping um, you could talk about what you hope this book does for its readers. Well, yes, I was just thinking about Franz Kafka's quote, and uh, it's interesting to me to to think of uh, literature in that way. And books. His, his friend Oscar Pollock said. We must read books that make us happy. In the, and in a letter, Franz Kafka took issue with that and said, anybody can write that kind of book. What we want is a book that comes like a blow to the head. Uh, must be the ax for the force and sea within us. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think uh, it, for the most part, I do like books that make us happy. I love uh, Ferdinand the Bull, for example. Uh, but I also like Moby Dick, which is a dark, dark, disturbing book. You know that we have, we must make room for that kind of thing. You're a poet. You 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 uh, you understand these things as uh, as I do. I think. Uh, but, but I'm thought to ask what I think that my book might, uh, might do. I want the reader of of the book to. Be aware of his relationship to nature. I want him to think about that and um, what nature means to him, what the earth means to him. Um, if, I, if, I can do, if I can accomplish that, I will be completely satisfied. I, uh, I want to, I want to uh, have a great part in um, saving the earth. I want to do what I can. That's, that's maybe my principal goal at the moment. I'm retired, I, I, I write. What I want to write about now is, is, uh, is that. I want to write things that call attention to the, to the earth and uh, to our understanding of, of, the, of the earth's value to us. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving the rest of my life to that, I think, and uh, means a lot to me. That's what, I, but, and I would like my book to, to uh, encourage others to think of, of uh, the earth in the same way. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Jill, um, I was wondering if you could read page um, 37 for us. When the great herds of buffalo drifted like a vast tide of rainwater over the green plains, it was a wonderful thing to see. But there came a day when the land was strewn with the flayed and rotting remains 
of those innumerable animals slain for sport or for nothing but their hides. The kaya was grieved and went hungry, and it was the human spirit that hungered most. It was a time of profound shame, and the worst thing of all was that the killers knew no shame. They moved on careless, having left a deep wound on the earth. We were ashamed. The earth does want shame. It wants love. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Mr. Mamade, we want to ask you about one of the most affecting lines in the book on page 37, which is the last line. The earth does not want shame, it wants love. It would be easy, given what we know about the climate crisis, to let our activism be driven by shame. But how is it so much uh, more important to let our activism be driven by love? Shame, I think, is a negative concept, and love is a positive one. And I think uh, we can we can uh, we 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 have to be ashamed of the way we've behaved towards the earth. We have to uh, we have to regret certain things that we have done in our in our uh, evolution. Now I think is the time, if if ever before. It is the time to give love to each other and to the earth. We see the destruction that has come about from our carelessness. We see the fires in uh, in uh, California, the floods in other parts of the country. We see a different kind of climate now, one that is much more destructive than it was, uh, say, a generation ago. Tornadoes rip uh, across the across parts of the country that have never been troubled by tornadoes before. So something we are coming very very fast to uh, a crisis, a point on the spectrum of of uh, history, where we must make a decision to save the earth or to ignore, ignore, ignore the, the saving. Um, we're in danger, we're in danger. We have a very narrow window now in which to change the course of events and to, and to, and to save ourselves and the earth. So in one way, it's very exciting to be at that stage of crisis uh, in another, it's terrifying, and we need to do something about it very quickly. So, as I say, I, I, I want to, I want to, do, I want to be one of the soldiers in that fight, and to uh, do what I can to to save the earth. I attribute things like the earth to the cause, and I will continue to do that. Well said. Very well said. And I, um, one of the ways I know you have contributed to the cause besides your writing is um, through the Buffalo Trust. And um, I'm wondering if you could tell the audience about the Buffalo Trust. Yes, yes. The Buffalo Trust is a, a nonprofit foundation that I that I've started uh, several years ago. And I I was hoping that it would um, to save to help to help indigenous peoples save their traditional values. I was thinking, of course, of the Native American and uh, his attitude towards towards the land and his uh, love of ceremony and his 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 uh, investment in the spiritual world. And so it has it is entirely successful. Um, we I've done work in uh, among the pueblos in. New Mexico, where I live, and I have worked with the Hante and Nenets people in in Siberia. Mm -hmm. I saved uh, I saved the the bear ceremony of the Hante people, which was their chief ceremony at one time, and which has been lost or nearly lost. So it's it's coming back, thanks to the work of the Buffalo Trust. The trust now is um, dormant. 
I I uh, I I had uh, uh, one of my one of my wives. I had a wife who ran the Buffalo Trust for me because she was so good at it. And uh, she passed away from cancer. Mm. So it uh, fell into a kind of stasis. But I'm reviving it now. And uh, I'm putting a new focus on it. And the focus is on uh, uh, preservation of the earth and the environment. So it's, it's, I think, it will be alive and well very soon again and uh, continue doing good work. Wonderful. Yeah, I would encourage the audience to um, check out the website for the Buffalo Trust as it comes comes back to life. And um, I just wanted to say there are so many um, ways, large and small, that someone can be an earth keeper. And um, what are some of the ways that speak to you? I'm sorry, say that again, will you? Sure. I, I said there are so many ways that large and small that someone could be an earth keeper. And I wondered, um, what are some of the ways that speak to you that people can keep the earth? Keep up with what is happening. Mm. Read, uh, read the newspapers and listen to the radios and televisions to see what is happening on that front. That's the main thing. It's a matter of educating oneself to, to what is happening and what can be done. Um, one can uh, read books that, uh, that uh, deal with, with relationships to the, and uh, formulate an idea of you know, what, what in our history enabled us to talk about, talk about uh, something commensurate to our capacity for wonder, for example. That's a, that's a great phrase, and, uh, and uh, it speaks directly to, to how we need to think about the earth at this point in time. Uh, one can uh, be an activist in the sense that you take part in, in things that are happening, illustrations uh, that take place for the, for the environment and so on. I have a friend here in Santa Fe who started, uh, uh, well, he started a, pro, a, a program, actually a sim, an event it was, to, to uh, fight hunger, to provide food for people who are hungry. And it was a great success. He invited a good many uh, uh, people of, of fame, uh, celebrities in, and they performed and uh, gathered quite a nice uh, sum of money for the, for the purpose. And we can do things like that. Uh, and uh, so many things I can't possibly list all of them. But, but uh, think about it. Think about what can be done and, and see what is happening. And uh, that's probably the advice we give. Yes, find everyone should find their sphere of influence. Uh, you've certainly found yours, so thank you. And I think Zoe has our last question. Um, yes. Um, so I I heard you say in another interview that you have faith in the human spirit. Um, so my question for you is, do you feel held by the human spirit in the same way you feel held by the earth? Yes, I believe in the human spirit. Uh, I, I, you know, one, one can help feeling uh, deeply about the human spirit when he hears uh, about such people as dragonfly, bringing the sun out of the ground, having that kind of belief in uh, in in uh, the power of the earth, the power of of the spirit, uh, the power of prayer, the power the power of of the human voice, uh, which is there's nothing much more powerful as far as I know. So I believe deeply in that spirit, and I believe that. Uh,
even in those things deep and uh, I think I think when most believe that fashion is on 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 that basis on those considerations on that kind of faith and that's important that's uh, that's not to be overlooked thank you so much mr mamade um when i read this book um it just felt i i i felt that and it felt alive um and it was really beautiful and they were the type of poems that that made me made me sort of like sit for a second so I could like fully absorb them um and you know just in the hustle of life it's so nice to just be able um to read a book like this and to read your words so I can just like ground myself again so thank you so much um for being here today and thank you Joe for reading um I'm going to pass it over to to Chris but thank you so much thank you too thank you hey Zoe yeah, I um, we've got to plug in this um, when um, I um, can you, Mr. Mamaday, we're going to ask a few more questions if you don't mind sticking with us. Um, but after I met Zoe uh, uh, and after I I, think I'm trying. Oh, I, I don't know if we're losing them. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, are you still there, Jill? We are. We just need to plug in and I can't find an extension. Okay. Cord. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We're doing the best we can. Um, I, after I met Zoe and we worked together on this interview and um, hearing you um, discuss today, Zoe, I just have to say that phrase that we say all the time, which, you know, the kids are all right. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we're in good hands. Um, Mr. Mamaday, I, I think Don has been holding some questions for us from the um, audience. Are you there, Don? I'm here. Okay, our first question, uh, Mr. Mamaday, there have been, been ma many Kiowa members in Oklahoma. Do you have family members in Anadarko or other Oklahoma towns? Yes, yes, indeed. I have, uh, I have uh, kinsmen in Anadarko, in Lawton, in Rainy Mountain. Um, Yes, I, I do, and you know, I, I am a member of the Kiowa Gourd Dance Clan, and it has a celebration in July, and so I, 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 uh, I try to keep up with, uh, with, with that, uh, that uh, group, that that society, and it's a it's a great way to keep in touch with uh, the Kiowa tribe. Thank you. Um, another question. How do you recommend we reconcile the connection to nature with use of technology, such as the zooming we're doing here today? Does changing the course mean halting the progress of science? Technology is very important to us. We can't do without it now. Um, uh, and, and it's, it's Moving along at such a rate, it's almost dizzy, dizzying. Um, I, uh, you know, I grew up without television, without uh, without uh, all of the uh, techn technological uh, uh, miracles that we that we live with now. I think we we are in a position. We are fast approaching a position where we can't do without them. They, they've become so much a part of our lives, but it's good to reflect on a time before, before these technological advances. Good, uh, it's good to reflect upon a time when uh, people lived uh, simply with, with, uh, you know, with uh, the the motions of the, of the earth, paying attention to the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. The flowing of rivers and the the uh, shade of trees and so on. That's a good thing for us, and, and it's important. It's becoming more and more important. The Earth is reminding us of these things, and so we better heed, better heed the Earth and uh, and act accordingly. I think we can do it, and I think I think we probably have no choice. Uh, the next question, where do you find hope in this time that feels so hopeless? 
in meditation, in prayer, in uh, uh, communion with nature, you know, go out and, as I say, if you want to be inspired, um, go out and look at uh, the mountains and the seas, the creeks. Go to some of our national parks, which are wonderful places uh, for, for meditation, for communing with nature. Um, you in California, you live close to Yosemite. What, what could be more wonderful than to go and spend a little time there and, and just uh, commune with, the, with, with, with nature there? It's a wonderful experience. Uh, people all over the world have places within reach, places of that kind within reach and they should avail themselves of them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question. How do you handle people who don't believe the climate is in crisis? Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, I think I better answer those people. Um, I, I know what you're saying, and, and it's a good question. How do you do it? Uh, I, I think you, you do it by continually broadcasting the value of, uh, of our relationship uh, to, to the earth and to, and to the natural world. That's, that's, uh, that's the short answer to that. You could go on talking about it, but, but that seems to be the most important step we can take. You're going to have to follow me. Oh, sir, we have to plug this in because it's going to die. We're getting close to the end here. Um, do you think poetry develops differently when coming from a space that elevates oral traditions? Do I think, I'm sorry, again? Yeah. Do you think poetry develops differently when coming from a space that elevates oral traditions? There is the difference between the oral tradition and, and and poetry. There is no such thing as poetry in 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 the Native American oral tradition. There are things that are poetic. Um, there there are verbal uh, equations that depend upon rhythm, and so on. But you know, it, it depends on on how you think of poetry. My definition of, of uh, a poem is, is a statement concerning the human condition composed in verse. And the key word there is verse, measure. Uh, and, and the Indian languages, moral tradition generally speaking, does not have that kind of man. Uh, but you know, you, there are certainly exceptions that we go back to Anglo-Saxon poetry, for example, Beowulf, it does have a measure, uh, but but Indian languages do not as a rule. So so when you talk about poetry, uh, you make a distinction between poetry as we understand it in Western civilization and, and uh, song, prayer, spells in uh, Native American tradition. So um, I think... I think I have I have in rear combined the two things. I I write uh, traditional English uh, prosody, but I also incorporate in many instances um, those from the oral tradition of the Native American, and I it works well for me. Thank you. Um, another question, how does a deep love of place counteract the strong fear of facing an uncertain future? Well, having an investment in place is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a security. It's a way of, of, of uh, building confidence within, within ourselves. The more familiar you become with a given landscape, I think the more 
the more the better able you are to to deal with uh, with uh, modern with 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 the, that threatenness on the on the modern scene, you know, uh, we uh, we lose touch with the land, we lose touch with place, and we're lost. We're lost. We have to struggle to find our way back into the familiar world, the world of safety and beauty, and and uh, and uh, so on. So, you know, one should. Uh, one should think of where he belongs in terms of space. You know, I'm I'm a southwestern man. I I grew up in this part of the of the world, and it is I, it is my homeland. And here I feel I belong. I have traveled widely over the world. I've circumnavigated the globe. In fact, this is the one place to which I gravitate, because. It, uh, it is where I am able to grow and, and work, contribute, and be alive. Thank you. Um, another person is wondering what the N in your name stands for. And they're asking, there, there must be a story there. <laughs> so what does the N and N Scott Mamaday stand for? The N stands for Navarre, Navarre, like the uh, the uh, province of Navarre, which is down in the Basque region between France and Spain, and and I was given that name by my mother, who uh, whose whose uh, ancestors some of some of her ancestors came from that part of the world, and so she gave me she gave me that name, and I have traveled there i've been into the pyrenees and so on and so i i think well my name is navarre i belong here or part of me belongs here i'm visiting my ancient ancient homeland thank you that's a story isn't it? Um, there's one last question. Um, it's actually from Zoe's mom. <laughs> um, she is wondering what advice do you have for young poets like Zoe? What advice would you have for all aspiring writers who are seeking to find their voice? Well, as, as uh, Jill pointed out, one of the professors <clears throat> advised me to write little and write well. Uh, and I think that's probably good advice. So Zoe being a poet, um, I think the, I think one of the, one of the bits of advice I would give her is to write slowly, uh, poetry demanding kind of expression. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it is, I think the crown of, of verbal, uh, literature, uh, that's almost a contradiction in terms, excuse me. It's the crown of, uh, of, uh, of our verbal expression, let me put it that way. And we need to be very careful when we write a poem because poetry at its best has no room for extraneous matter. Every syllable in a poem should count and that takes concentration, it takes time, but it is well worth it because if you write a if you write a uh, a good poem, you have done something that is uh, very much worth doing and not easy to do. My that's my advice. Great, thank you so much, um, Mr. Mamaday, Jill. Zoe, Chris, <laughs> uh, what a wonderful interview. Um, we're just so pleased to have you and I will turn it over to Chris. Yes, thank you um, all of you again. And um, the people we need to thank um, a lot for this and so much we do around the library is the Friends of the Castro Valley Library. Um, they are our fundraisers and they made this event possible and so many of our other events. So thank you to the Friends. Um, 
I did want to share that we have copies of the Earth Keeper in the library collection as print book, ebook, and e audio book. So you can hear Mr. Mamaday reading. Um, and I also, um, if you're participating in Castro Valley Reads, we have your free copies for pickup beginning uh, at three o'clock today. Um, I did want to share um, my screen um, one last time, if I can, and um, share about some, if this is, if I can get this to work, sorry, let me go back. More technical problems. <laughs> um, let me just, thanks for your patience, everybody. Um, here we go. I wanted to share about some upcoming events that um, we have, and I wanted to put them on the screen. And um, here we go. So um, we have a really wonderful event um, coming up with uh, Cafe Ohlone, and um, we are going to be offering a virtual cooking demonstration from Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, who are the founders of Cafe Ohlone. And they will share with us about um, native food ways revitalization and Ohlone cuisine. Uh, Ma'akma means our food in the Chochenyo Ohlone language. The library staff is actively forming partnerships with the local indigenous community. I also want to um, invite you to Climate Change 101 on February 7th at 6.30. Uh, the library will be hosting environmental scientist, Dr. Andrew Gunther for a presentation about the effects of climate change in the Bay Area. So please visit our website to register for these and other events. And again, um, thank you to everyone today on the panel and thank you to Dawn and the friends of the library. And I wish you guys um, out there in listening um, go be earth keepers and thank you for participating today. <laughs>